So, you know, we see vitamin C extremely low. Now, I just read an amazing book, amazing book. I believe it was titled Curing the Incurable, but it's all about vitamin C. And I posted some screenshots to my followers about the some of the spark notes in it. Now, yeah. one, of, one of the big ones here is that goats, apparently goats are just incredible, healthy savages. I mean, they just don't have the real sickness. So check this out. Okay. This is from the book here. This is curing the incurable. It's all about vitamin C. This is regarding yeah. illnesses in children, pertussis. We're talking, uh, some of this study is from the thirties. We're talking pre-vaccine for polio and all of that, right? Now here it says here, goats are believed to produce as much as a hundred thousand milligrams of vitamin C daily when faced with life-threatening infections or toxic stress. Here was another, this was, a uh, in, in the 1920s, you know, tuberculosis was huge. And tuberculosis was a, a big threat. It says here, a daily vitamin C intake greater than 90 milligrams and eating more than the average amount of fruits, vegetables, and berries lowered the risk of contracting tuberculosis. Here was another one. A study followed 85,000 women for 14 right. years. They found no association with vitamin C and increased risk of kidney stones. Same thing in 45,000 men. So some people in the in the online health space, you know, they'll freak out about vitamin C and they'll say, hey, you're going to create oxalate issues. You're going to create kidney stones. I haven't found it to be true. Candida and fungal issues drive up oxalates way more. And when we fix that, the oxalates go down. So I think vitamin Correct. C, is it's a huge deficiency. It, it's almost everyone we see because humans we can't synthesize it like pretty much all Correct. other creatures. And also certain electrolytes like magnesium and potassium do ex help push to excrete oxalates. And so by increasing your magnesium and potassium, you're going to also help improve that, improve that excretion. So that's a good thing there too. And if I just um, highlight one more thing, I want to pull this back up here just to make it clear to everyone. So we talked about iron on this. We made that super clear. Iron's a big deal. We talked about at least eight milligrams, but up to 30 or 40, if you're a menopause or if you're a cycling woman who has a lot of heavy bleeding, hemorrhagia, we may go much higher than that. Now, when it comes to B12, we could throw in other B vitamins, berry, berry, B1, B2 with riboflavin, B3, niacin, or nicotinamide riboside chloride, some of the NADH products. So we could definitely expand B vitamins. And we know that plays a big role with energy. Magnesium, we talked about the heart, magnesium is a natural beta blocker. So do we see cardiovascular issues on the rise? Yeah, magnesium is a natural vasodilator. It helps relax the heart and it helps lower blood pressure, helps with stress, and it gets depleted with high glucose. Vitamin D is a big one. Obviously, we're going to try to get it from the sun, but we may need four or five or maybe even 10,000 IUs. And of course, that's going to Im impact the immune system. Um, vitamin D impacts T regulatory cells, and yeah, it helps with calcium absorption and phosphorus absorption. Uh, I want to add in here potassium. Potassium, we need about 4,700 milligrams for the DRI. So we can put potassium here and we don't get enough. I challenge the average person to go through and just look at potassium. We don't get enough. Run it through a chronometer. Go to chronometer.com, run your diet through the day. You'll probably find that you may only get two to 3,000 milligrams a day of potassium. And that's really important. Our cells need the sodium potassium pump, sodium in, potassium out for our cells to work well and to have good communication via cell membrane. And so we need healthy sodium potassium, potassium. So 4,700 milligrams a day. And again, like your best sources are going to be your avocados and they'll be your best. The average person is probably thinking banana and eh, potassium is twice as high in avocados and banana. And then of course, CoQ10, really important for energy. Uh, also very much helps the thyroid antibodies. If there's a lot of thyroid inflammation or TPO antibodies, magnesium, CoQ10, and we even add in selenium can be very helpful with heart and energy and thyroid inflammation. So 200, maybe even up to 500 if we're older. The older we get, the less CoQ10 we make. And again, if we're taking a statin, statins block the mevalonic acid pathway that causes you to make CoQ10. And last but not least, and I'll let Evan kind of riff a little bit more, zinc, really important for fingernails, really important for your immune cells, really important for making stomach acid. Guess what? If you don't have enough stomach acid and enzymes, all these nutrients are going to be for naught because a lot of times you need good stomach acid and enzyme levels to break these things down, ionize them, and absorb them. And so zinc's really important. Also important for your hair as well. And we'll throw selenium on there. Selenium is really important for your hair, for your thyroid antibodies, for your liver, for recycling glutathione. And we need two to 400 micrograms of selenium a day, ideally in a selenomethionine or selenium bisglycinate form. Grab your phone. I think it's on your desk and it's buzzing in my earbuds. 
<laughs> yeah, CoQ10, uh, it's huge. I'm glad you good? brought up CoQ10. So CoQ10 is also something I see depleted all the time in people that have had the virus or the injection. And there's yep. papers on that. Just type in uh, the virus CoQ10. You can read about that. It's yep. also been very protective. Uh, same thing that we saw with vitamin D. People that had adequate vitamin D, they were not dying if they got infected versus the people Correct. that had vitamin D deficiencies, all the people in the ICU, they had vitamin D levels of a 30 or less. And the same thing we're seeing in the literature with the CoQ10, which is that if you have adequate CoQ10, you are more protected. And Correct. so Correct. Uh, th there's a paper here I was reading. It was titled Coenzyme Q10 Therapeutic uh, Potencies Against the Virus and Other Similar Infections. And the long story short was, of course, you need more CoQ10. And you can measure that in the uh, organic acids. We can look at CoQ10 there. So, Yeah. And I got a study here looking at combined supplementation of coenzyme CoQ10 and how important it is for mitochondrial bioenergetics, for membrane antioxidant protection. Uh, and that just basically almost you know, specific medical conditions are associated with low circulating CoQ10. Um, so really important that we're dialed in with that. Plus things like statins can drop CoQ10 production. So it's really important that we're on top of that. And again, with CoQ10, a lot of times we'll do it in a reduced form. We'll do a ubiquinol form. Reduced means there's already an electron added to it. So it's already converted and activated. Um, so that's important. The ubiquinone is the actual CoQ10 form. And so we want to we want to really, really be on top of that. And so I'm going to just kind of scroll here to the end of the study. But CoQ10 plays a really important role in the electron transport chain. So you can see low CoQ10 associated with breast cancer. It's important for DNA repair. They're talking about 300 milligrams a day, right? They saw it. Um, they saw basically reduced oxidative damage and inflammation levels in post-surgical patients with hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, the benefits of single CoQ10 in cancers are either preventative or protective rather than curative, meaning, you know, do it before or not. You still would want to do it if you have it, but you'd want to be on top of it beforehand.